I'm Priscilla Barrera with the Investing News Network, and here with me today is John Highway of Stormcrow Capital. John, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, thank you for having me, Priscilla. All right, so we're here at the Lithium Supply and Markets Conference. How are you finding the event so far? Very well attended, um, very dynamic. A lot of uh, investors here as well, which is encouraging. And at a point where we're actually seeing real money being put to work to build projects now in this in this generation of lithium uh, excitement, it's it's nice to see. Right. And yesterday the discussion was around electric cars. What is your outlook for EV adoption? Are you optimistic? I yes. Now I'm I'm usually regarded as a contrarian and something of a pessimist. My version of optimism might not jive with some other people's version of optimism, but in the long run, I, I have no doubt electric vehicles are cheaper, they are a better technology than internal combustion, and with the developments in battery technology and some of the other engineering that's happening, I think we're going to see this, this push towards electrification continue and maybe even accelerate. All right, and many continue to talk about a shift in battery technology which could potentially impact raw materials such as cobalt, but will it be easy to make a shift at this point? That's a pretty broad question. And, and yes and no, I think, is the unfortunate answer. Um, when people talk about a shift in battery technology, they're generally talking about changes in the chemistry of the batteries, changes in the, in the fundamental composition of the what's called the cathode active materials, the things that are actually storing and, and, and providing electricity. To make changes, really wholesale changes at this point, is going to be difficult because that tends to have knock-on effects throughout the rest of the battery supply chain. These things, if they're happening, are going to occur over a period of time. To make changes to the demand in, in certain chemicals and certain, and certain metals through the application of slightly different technology is perhaps more possible. All right. And yesterday you were talking about some alternatives to the current technology. Do we really need to use cobalt and nickel in batteries? And can you talk a bit as to how a future technology without these metals will look like? There's no question if you want your cell phone to last for an entire day on one charge or you want your laptop to do the same or you're looking for a battery electric vehicle, one with only batteries on board that can carry you a full day of driving then the answer is you're going to need nickel for sure and you're going to need cobalt almost as certainly for a long time to come. And the reason why is nickel provides in, in the formulations that we currently use, like what, what are usually termed NAC and NMC, which is really lithium nickel aluminum cobalt oxide or lithium nickel manganese cobalt oxide. We need the nickel for the energy density and unfortunately, we need some cobalt for stability. We need that to ensure that there's not uh, something catastrophic happening to the battery. So we're not going to get away from that. Where I differ, I think, from some of my colleagues here who are in the lithium industry and, and want to continue waving the flag for batteries as they stand, is that I look at, at technology substitutions as well. And one of the more promising things that's happened, and it's not just me saying that, um, the CEO of General Motors has said that the Chevrolet Bolt will be the first electric vehicle that makes money for its manufacturer. Think about that, because Tesla has not done that consistently or much at all in terms of what they've been able to do. That design that the Bolt carries is something that the industry here, the automotive industry here, terms a weak hybrid. It's a design where you have an internal combustion engine turning a generator acting as a range extender for a much smaller battery pack than would otherwise be required. And the idea is, using a small battery, you provide enough electricity on board that if you plug it in overnight, you can run this as a battery electric vehicle most days of the week. But if you need to drive 400 or 500 kilometers on the weekend and don't have time to recharge, then you run your range extender. You burn gasoline very efficiently because the engine is running at one speed near its optimal point of performance, and you create electricity on board. You also have the advantage that you don't need to recharge on those long trips. You also don't have to worry about finding a charging station downtown or anywhere else because the car can recharge itself. It's a much more flexible design. It's an inexpensive design, potentially. There's only one drivetrain. It's only electric. And in other parts of the world, 
it's something that could be adopted by buyers who can't afford a $130,000 Tesla. So it's something that, that will push forward, I think, on the electrification side. Now, the implications for batteries are you're now looking for a battery that doesn't have extremely high energy density, like the battery that you need to keep your cell phone or your laptop or your Tesla running all day. You're looking for a battery that has really good longevity and the ability to accept and, and output a large amount of power. The energy side is handled by the gasoline and by the, and by the range extender. And so that points to slightly different battery chemistries, not so much NMC and NAC anymore, but something like lithium iron phosphate, a fairly common battery that's used in power tools, and which, unfortunately, the Chinese dominate the production of. So all of this feeding in, it's possible that for these lower-end vehicles, where you want to provide a really great value and all the operational flexibility you can because the family buying them can only afford one vehicle, this ties directly in. Lithium iron phosphate batteries are cheap, they last for a very long time, they will work extremely well in that application, and they don't require cobalt and nickel, which leaves a lot more of cobalt and nickel for the rest of us to put in our battery electric vehicles and our, and our high-end cell phones. All right. And um, what are your thoughts on solid-state batteries? Will these type of batteries be cheaper than the current lithium-ion batteries? Ooh, threw me a curveball there. Okay, um, solid-state batteries. For, for people who aren't really sure of what that is, a battery is essentially a sandwich. It's, it's a cathode foil, a conductive cathode foil, with some particles of active material on it, this is where these all these this alphabet soup of chemicals comes in, whether these are NAC particles or NMC particles or LFP particles or LCO particles, doesn't really matter. The point is there's a chemical on there that holds lithium. And on the other side, there's a conductive foil with particles of material on it that can accept lithium. Usually today that's graphite. In between is where the fun happens. So in between, today, for most batteries, you have a little porous piece of plastic that separates the anode from the cathode and keeps them from short-circuiting. The battery industry is so, so imaginative that this part is called a separator. And it's filled with a liquid that contains lithium. That's called an electrolyte. Now, the problem is that, that electrolyte is flammable. If heat builds up in the battery and the battery ruptures for any reason, you get a fire. That's what's causing a lot of the problems that we've seen in the past with laptops bursting into flame, phones bursting into flame, 787 Dreamliners having fires in their batteries, Teslas magically catching fire for no reason, and all of the rest of it. It's this sort of cell failure that, that is a problem. A solid state battery replaces that electrolyte and that plastic separator with a solid material. That solid material is, can be a polymer, a plastic. It can be a ceramic. If it's a ceramic or a good plastic, it's not flammable. It can be made much thinner than that porous piece of plastic and that electrolyte. And that means that the cells then take up a lot less room for the same amount of power and the same amount of energy storage. The advantage to that is your energy density goes way up. You can with the same size stack of batteries push your Tesla much further down the road, or it means you can put fewer batteries in, which reduces the cost, potentially, because we don't really know what the cost of these things is going to be. And unfortunately, the engineering around getting lithium ions to move freely, to move quickly through a solid is a little rough. So on what time scale we're going to see these things, I don't know. And is there a niche that would be willing to, say, pay a much higher cost up front for the advantage of a much smaller battery? Maybe cell phones? Maybe laptops and tablets? Would they be willing to pay a lot more? That I can't answer. So whether this technology manages to wedge its way into the market is still an open question. But it's certainly an interesting technology path moving forward. Right. Um, and what are your thoughts on recycling of raw materials for lithium-ion batteries? It's starting to become something that we could, we could see conceivably happening over a reasonable time frame. You're starting to put large enough collections of batteries in one place in the form of cars that you can pull them all out and, and theoretically run them through a process. The problem with a lot of this, though, is 
if you're going to do it at commercial scale, you're going to be inputting a lot of batteries from a lot of different sources. Are the batteries that come out of that Chevrolet Bolt in any way the same as the ones that come out of that Tesla Model S? Do they have the same chemistry? What contaminants do they contain? How are you going to process all this? Now, I know there are a few companies out there doing reasonable work on trying to build really robust industrial processes. You know, things where the batteries just get shoveled into a hopper. You don't have to separate them. You don't worry about it. They get shredded, you know, and, and leached with acids, and basically the, the materials are reclaimed. Now you're looking for materials like cobalt or some of the expensive conductors, if there's any silver or any gold used in any of this. But in the future, obviously, we're, we're hoping to be able to recover things like lithium as well. Maybe even recover the lithium chemicals as they stand. You know, recover them as NMC or NAC rather than breaking them down to the elements and having to reconstitute them later. If we can do things like that, if we develop industrial processes like that, then recycling for batteries has a really, really good future. All right, and final, my last question for you today. What's ahead for the battery metal sector? What factors do you think will impact the market in the short term? <laughs> um, I would say if I, were to, if I were to drill down to one thing in the lithium space, for example, that I think is going to be important over the next few years, it would be the impact of new technology in the space. So you're starting to see companies like Namaska, which has recently closed their, their construction financing, looking to deploy a technology that will provide the ability to produce battery-grade lithium hydroxide from hard rock, from spodumene, at much lower costs than anybody has been able to contemplate before. You're starting to see technologies like the POS LX process that's been developed by POSCO, which should be able to take brines and not only process it into battery chemical much less expensively, but liter for liter of brine produce a lot more lithium than the conventional process, than conventional solar evaporation. And you're starting to see, you're starting to see processes like, like the uh, Lipidico um, process out of Australia that can process lithium micas and deal with the fact that there's fluorine in there and not poison the workers or the rest of the area, you know, or destroy the, the facility itself with all of that fluorine. All of these things, whether you're looking at new sources of, of lithium as feedstock, whether you're looking at just cheaper production, or whether you're looking at, at enhanced production that's less expensive as well, those are going to have a major impact on the lithium space moving forward. In the overall battery metal sector, I'd say the only thing that's going to be constant is change. Uh, I expect surprises in the space, especially around chemistries, um, as, as they evolve. For example, recently I've heard from, from contacts in China that customers that were consistently ordering NMC and doing nothing but have started to order lithium iron phosphate, LFP, instead. The, the reason behind that, generally speaking, is cobalt has increased in price so much that it's become cost-effective or, or not cost-effective for them to use NMC any longer. And they're looking at replacing NMC in lower-end devices or in lower-end applications with cheaper LFP. Different performance envelope, but a drastic change in, in the metal profile that's demanded. And that's, that's having an impact. I guess, you know, surprise is what awaits us in the space. Thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, you're welcome. <laughs>